Folks, welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. My name is Shane Morris, and today we have a guest who's going to talk to us about what may be the most basic of all questions. Where did we come from? Specifically, where and how did life begin? And can naturalistic evolution account for it? Dr. James Tour is a synthetic organic chemist who specializes in nanotechnology. He serves as professor of materials science and nanoengineering, as well as computer science at Rice University in Houston. He holds a PhD from Purdue University and has done uh, postdoctoral work at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Stanford. He's also a visiting scholar at Harvard and has published over 650 academic articles. Of course, most importantly to Dr. Tour, he's a follower of Christ who was persuaded through scripture and reason and the illumination of the spirit that God is the author, not just of biological life, but also of our new life as Christians. Dr. Tour, welcome to the Breakpoint Podcast. It's good to have you on. Thank you. There's a video that I came across a few weeks ago with the Discovery Institute where you talk about the origin of life. And you mention in the beginning of that video that the idea of the first cell coming together in a prebiotic environment is not as plausible as we're led to believe. Tell us what you mean by that. Okay, so there's several steps to think about making a cell. And we have to have a cell before we have any evolution. Evolution starts once you're at a cell. But making of the cell is a big, big problem. And what's normally put out there by people is that there was some primordial soup and some lightning flashes and then molecules came together and formed a cell and that formed then some slithering creatures and that came out of the pond and that was life. That's fallacious, it's a bunch of nonsense. We have no idea how any of those steps works no scientist does. If any scientists say they do, they're lying. They don't have it. Ask them for details and you will see them start to sweat. There's zero details. So what you have to do is you have to make four classes of compounds. You have to make amino acids and that's what forms all our proteins and enzymes, most of the enzymes, but certainly all our proteins from those amino acids. So you have to first make the amino acids and you got to get them on chirally pure form, which is very, very difficult. Then you've got to somehow get them hooked together. They don't spontaneously hook together. And they've got to hook together in the right order. Very hard to do that. You've got to have your nucleic acids, which is your DNA and RNA. And so you have these five different bases that you're going to need. And they all have to be made. And then those get hooked together, but they need sugars, carbohydrates, to hook them together. So you also then need sugars and carbohydrates. Very hard chemistry to do and they have multiple stereogenic centers or what used to be called chiral centers and very hard to hook them together. Really complex chemistry even in a modern laboratory. Nobody knows how that was done under a rock in a cave in a primordial environment. And then you have to have the lipids. The lipids are not as simple as people think they are. They have to have it be a diacial lipid and there's usually another stereogenic center as part of that. And so you have all those four classes of chemicals, they all have to be made and they all have to reside in the same place. And it's not like something can make them and then go away. You have to uh, go bad. I mean, they go bad actually rather quickly, particularly the carbohydrates, the sugars, go bad really quite quickly. And so you have to be able to deal with those. So that's just getting the four basic elements together. Do you want me to go on or do you want to ask some more questions? Because I need to go on through the assembly step, but you tell me what you want to talk about. Oh, there's so much complexity to talk about, but I think we want to sort of unpack the implications of this when it comes to talking about the origin of life. You speak of, in the video, of a biologist really being out of his or her depth when they're talking about an issue like this, because biology begins when life begins, right? I mean, that's the question Darwin tries to answer in Origin of Species is, well, how did the diversification take place? But he doesn't address the question of where life began, and that question has remained, if I'm interpreting this correctly, to a large extent, very much unanswered. So what's the difference there between biological and pre-biological? Why is that distinction so important? Yeah, so you're right. I mean, evolution deals, once we have life, how does that life change into the diversity of life that we see on planet Earth? It doesn't deal with where did life come from originally? Where did the first cell come from? Charles Darwin never dealt with it. It's a much more difficult problem to think about. We are clueless even today. There was an experiment that was done in 1952 by Miller and Urey where they took some flashes of voltages and some 
chemicals that are presumed to be abundant on prebiotic earth, CO2, cyanide, formaldehyde, and you put that all together and you get some flashes, yeah, you can get some amino acids out. And everybody thought, wow, we're ready going to figure this out. That was 67 years, 68 years ago. So that was more than two thirds of a century ago. So much has happened since then in science and technology. That field hasn't moved, origin of life hasn't moved. It is a huge problem. Once you have the basic four classes of chemicals, you have to put those things together. Even if you could have them all in the same place, all at the same time, which is really hard to do because they're made in, by different chemistries and they're made by over multiple steps and how you have the mass transfer to get enough there to do any chemistry is hard and how you get them all in the same place nobody knows nobody knows the answer to any of the questions that I'm raising nobody and then you've got to get them assembled even if we were to give you all the four classes of chemicals in purified form to the greatest scientists in the world just take a team of them you give them all together and you give it to them and say now I'll give you all of these, not out under some rock somewhere, right here in your pristine laboratory. You've got all your freezers, all your equipment. Could you build a cell out of this? And they'd be like, huh? No, no way. We have no idea how to put those components together to build a cell. If anybody tells you they do, they're wrong. You have to have a lipid bilayer, and they'll make what they call a protocell. But that's not the same as a lipid bilayer in a eukaryotic cell. A eukaryotic cell has, it has to have lots of functioning pieces to it. You have to have carbohydrates displayed from the surface, and nobody knows how to get these carbohydrates hooked up. It's just a mess. And then once you get the cell, once you, once you have a bilayer, even if you want to say, well, we'll just squirt this other stuff in and it'll start forming, that's a bunch of nonsense. You can't do that. So none of it works. Nobody knows where life came from. Nobody knows where the code of life, because the DNA has to be in a certain order. And I've talked with different people who said that they know how they can get spontaneous information. And I say, show me what level of information you've got there. It's nothing. It's nothing. It's nowhere close. So we're clueless on this. We are absolutely clueless. There's a lot of other things on evolution that we're clueless about, but this is before evolution ever starts. You got to get the first cell. How do you get the first cell? Nobody knows. And yet if we read textbooks, we read popular science magazines, it seems there's this level of confidence that this issue has been solved. You mentioned the Miller-Urey experiment where we continually go back to this experiment conducted in the 50s with a bunch of chemicals designed to simulate the, at that time, what was thought to be the prebiotic earth, the primordial earth, and then strike it with lightning in essence. And then some amino acids or not even proteins, just amino acids come together. And that is taken as the solution to the problem. But you say we haven't actually made any progress in 67, 68 years on the question, why this level of confidence in the media, in science textbooks, if we really don't know how it happened? Well, they're not confident when they talk to me. I mean, it's all of a sudden their confidence goes away and they start confessing, yes, that we don't know how many of these steps worked. So uh, their confidence is on display when there's people who don't know any better. And it's just a shame because their confidence has made generations of students think that they know and then professors think that other people know but we don't we're absolutely clueless on this and so I mean I'll sit with any one of them and we'll talk about the details and I'll ask them for the details show me the details they don't have it and uh, doing this on a prebiotic earth and those amino acids that they got that's just one component and they were achiral and there was no way to hook them up and even when they do this I mean, it's hard to describe how much cheating they do when they try to do this in their labs and they say this is sort of like a prebiotic earth. So in other words, they will mix A and B in a pristine laboratory and get C. And then they will identify that compound C in a morass of many other compounds because there's a little peak on one of their machines. And then what they do, rather than trying to purify that C and take it on to the next product D is that they buy that product C because they can't purify it from the mess that they made. So they cheat at every step. Every step is cheating. So it's a bunch of nonsense. Well, Dr. Tour, what about time? What if I just add a bunch of time? I mean, given enough billions of years, anything should be probable, right? Anything should be at least possible. Talk to us about that solution. Does that work? No, time is actually the enemy. 
for organic synthesis, time is the enemy. So the very same reactions that would make a carbohydrate would break down the carbohydrate. These are not thermodynamic products, meaning the most stable product that could form. These are all kinetic products, meaning that they form, but they're not the most stable. So if you leave the reaction just a little bit too long, you start getting other products. You start getting the degradation products of it. You get polymerization, and you get what's called a Conazaro reaction, which goes back, especially when you have an earth that's filled up with a lot of formaldehyde in it, and these things go back. Even if you want to say there's not a lot of oxygen there, so you don't have to worry about oxidative degradation, okay, I'll give them that. We'll say there, there was ammonia there. So ammonia is highly degrading. Ammonia makes imines, ammonia is basic, and you can get uh, enolate-like chemistry going on. It's a real mess. So the compounds don't sit there. And so if you want to make a compound in the lab, what you do is you have to stop the reaction as soon as your product is optimized, separate it from all the starting materials that we're making it to form, and then keep it in a freezer. Why do you keep it in a freezer away from light? Because light is terribly degrading to these organic molecules, especially as soon as they start having some conjugated, some extended pi framework. It degrades them. And so time is actually the enemy. And so the way we get past that in the laboratory is we isolate it and we keep it in a freezer away from light at a very low temperature to inhibit its degradation. You may have gotten a bottle of medicine and it'll always have an expiration date on that. And that expiration date might be like a year away. Well, imagine waiting a billion years to take that. I mean, you're in big trouble because these things degrade and that's in a nice bottle away from all other reagents. And these things are not stored. So actually time for organic synthesis is the enemy. And it's like if you left a part from a car and you say, well, I'm going to build with this and you leave it outside for a year, it's covered with rust and it's degraded and you can't use that anymore. You have to sandblast it and try to remachine it so that it can be used. So, and that's one year. I mean, you want to throw a billion years at it? I mean, that part is gone. And, and so it's a bunch of nonsense. Well, the reason this is so interesting is because, I mean, for biological evolution, there's at least a proposed mechanism. Granted, there are a lot of problems still with the process that have been identified by many authors in the intelligent design movement. But with prebiotic evolution, if we can use such a bold phrase, there is no mechanism identified. So there is no, you know, mutation, random variation, natural selection, sorting those things out. If there's no process, the analogy of leaving car parts out in a junkyard and hoping they come together through natural forces is actually very apt, right? It's not like, you know, the blind watchmaker kind of thing that Richard Dawkins talks about. Yeah, and it's not just car parts in a junkyard that are all in the same junkyard. Our junkyard is planet Earth, and some of these parts are at the bottom of the sea by some vent, and some are on the top of a mountain. And some would say, no, a lot of these parts came from outer space. So, our junkyard is the universe. And you, you take these car parts and you got to spread them out now all over the universe and hope that they don't degrade by the time they somehow miraculously all get to the same place and then somehow assemble. But even if you're given all the car parts in pristine form, a mechanic can build a car. You give all the chemical parts in pristine form to any scientist, they can't build it. They can't do it. So somehow under a rock someplace, in some mindless environment, and there's no code. Even if we gave them the code that we knew is present in cells, they can't construct the cell. And so you have to have the whole code. So nothing works, it's such a big mess, and it's just a shame that a generation, multiple generations of students have been betrayed. And so that's the true story. What about crystals? I've heard this theory that life could maybe form on the back of crystals because they spontaneously create, you know, symmetrical shapes and so forth. What about that? Could that work? Yeah, many people have tried that. Many people have tried not to create life. That's silly. But what they've tried to do is use that as a catalyst to make chiral, homochiral compounds. And so lots of people have tried that. Could and you define even that term for us real quickly? Homochiral? Yeah, so what chiral is, is that your left hand and your right hand are chiral to one another. And so they are non-superimposable mirror images. So if you hold up your left hand and you hold up your right hand facing it, they will look like mirror images of one another. If you hold up your right hand into a mirror, 
what you would see in the mirror is actually your left hand. You would not see another right hand. So they're non-superimposable mirror images. They're non-superimposable, meaning that you cannot take your right hand and stick it into a left-handed glove. And so the vast majority of organic compounds are chiral like that. And so to make them homochiral, where you just have, say, the right-handed one and not the left-handed, or just the left-handed one and not the right-handed, is really hard to do in a laboratory. We know how to do it. It's really hard. And these techniques have only been developed in the last 30 years. But to do this on the back of crystals, people have tried it in the laboratory where they've taken really good crystals that show a high orientation of something, and they've tried to have molecules form on that to get them to be homochiral, one chirality. And they've never been very successful. They've had very small enhancements on this. So if you can't even do it in the lab, with all the intellect of human beings pointing toward that, how would you do it in the environment? But I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I'll give you the chiral crystals that make the homochiral compounds. You got it. You want that? You got it. Now make the cell. Now hook these amino acids together. What chemistry are you going to use to hook that together? It's very hard to do that. And what chemistry are you going to use to hook the carbohydrates together? That's a much bigger problem. Nobody addresses carbohydrates, just the sugars that, that you eat every day. Nobody wants to address that because that one is really, really hard. Nobody knows how to do that. So I'll even give you all the sugars in homochiral form. And sugars are much harder to make in homochiral form than are the amino acids because they have multiple chiral centers. So if you have, for example, four chiral centers, you have two to the fourth possible isomers of this. It's just, it becomes a combinatorial mess. I'm Steve Ryder, producer of the Breakpoint Podcast. I hope you're enjoying Shane Morris's interview with Dr. James Tour about the origin of life. We'll get back to them in just a moment. I wanted to let you know that now is the time to register for the annual Wilberforce Weekend, which takes place May 14th through the 17th, just across the river from D.C. Come and join us as we honor Chinese Christian and Pastor Bob Fu for his work on behalf of the persecuted church in China. You'll also meet and hear from Christian thought leaders like Oz Guinness, Lee Strobel, Andy Crouch, and more. Come to WilberforceWeekend.org for more details and to register. WilberforceWeekend.org. So, Dr. Tour, just to emphasize the insurmountable nature of this problem, let's do what you've been uh, suggesting. Grant all the raw materials. We've got all the molecules that we need already to form life. We put them in an ideal laboratory circumstance, and we say to the best synthetic organic chemist in the world, okay, put these things together now, make a living cell. That's not even, you know, that's not chance. That's not under a rock somewhere in the primordial pool. This is under intelligent supervision. How likely is that scientist to come out with a living cell? Well, we won't just take one organic chemist. We'll take the top 10 in the world. And we'll tend and add the top 10 microbiologists and the top 10 evolutionary biologists and let them invite all their friends that they like. <laughs> All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put this together. <laughs> it cannot happen. They wouldn't even know how to begin to put this together. And even if you tried to do this, the alignment is amazing. Just the non-covalent interactions of all the proteins in just a very simple yeast cell is 10 to the 79 billion. This is a one with 79 billion zeros after it. This is what's called the interactomes. Oh, nobody knows how to do this. They're so clueless. And then even if you line this thing up, nobody knows how to get the spark of life. Because you can take a cell that has just died, and you say, okay, well, everything's kind of in place because it was just living and it's just died. How about you, you just practice on that and get that started to live again? They'd be like, uh, I don't know how to do that. They can't, even if it had everything in place, they wouldn't even be able to get this thing that just stopped living to be living. And we can't even define what living is. Some people say it's the ionic potentials. Others say it's much greater than that. So even just for scientists to define what's living, they would just sit there and try to have a discussion on what is the meaning of living. Because they couldn't address the topic that you asked them to do. There's your answer. 
this underscores the magnitude of the mystery of life to science even to this day. We're talking about, you know, a car in a junkyard randomly assembling itself and the junkyard being the entire universe. At this point, we're talking about a car that's sitting on the lot fully assembled, turned off. And we don't even know how to turn that car back on. We don't even know how to turn the key. That's the degree to which cellular life is a mystery to us. Is that a fair description? That's a very good description. We don't know how to turn it back on. As soon as that cell goes off, try to turn it back on, and uh, we just don't know. Do you think the hopelessness of creating life spontaneously in prehistoric conditions, like we've seen proposed in the Miller-Urey experiment and so forth, do you think it contributes to this feverish search for life on other planets? I mean, I see headlines all the time where, you know, water has been found on Mars or Europa or some other moon. And there's this undertone to the article that basically this is a guarantee of life. We're just virtually guaranteed now to find life there. Is that fair? Is that scientific? No, it's not accurate. I mean, the lifelessness that we see on every other planet is exactly what we should expect. That this is an anomaly. This is a unique situation to have a planet filled with life like this. If we find signs of life on any planet, anywhere near this planet, there's a good chance that that life or those remains of life came from this planet. By there was some ejection, something hit this planet, something ejected and was thrown up into space and traveled there and landed on that planet. And I mean, planetary scientists are well aware of this, that we have things on this planet that have come from Mars and there's things on Mars that have definitely come from the Earth. And so you have to distinguish where it came from. But no, the lifelessness that we see. But again, there may be life on other planets. It's just hard to figure out how it started. And it may have started on another planet other than Earth. That could well have happened and then was ejected here or some beings dropped it off here. That can happen. But what we're talking about is something called origin of first life. Not origin of life on Earth, but origin of first life. You still got to back this up to have that life on the other planet start. And what would be the conditions to get that to start? So nobody knows. Now, I will tell you as a scientist, I could never say that it will never be known. I could never do that because we don't know what the future holds. We don't know what people are going to figure out in 500 years or 1,000 years. If you had asked a man on the street in the mid-1800s, where is information stored in a cell? They'd say, I don't know, it must be God. No, no well, now we know the information is stored in the DNA. And so there are things that we learn with time. This one is a really hard one because we're getting further from the target every year. And so you can see whether there's a path to solving a problem by you're getting closer to it. But what happens is we're getting further from it. How could we be getting further from it? It's because every year there's so much more information that we get on the complexity of a cell. Whether you want to take a eukaryotic cell, which is like cells from animals like us, or you want to take a bacterium, which some people say are simpler. In, many, in some ways it's simpler, in some ways it's more complex. It doesn't matter. The complexity of those are getting so much harder that every year that our target is getting further and further away. So it's not like we're en route to solve this thing anytime soon. And by anytime soon, I mean in, in 100 years, it doesn't look like we're going to be able to solve this thing. Now, I can never say what the future holds. But as of today, we are utterly clueless. And to project as if we know or we have clues is wrong. What kind of power do you think worldview assumptions are bringing to the table here? Are biologists and reporters and all those who claim that we have the origin of life figured out, are they just afraid of the alternative here? Is it just a commitment to philosophical naturalism? What's driving the false confidence? Well, most people have a false confidence because they just don't know the science. If they knew the chemistry, they would at least be able to curb some of the things that they say. And uh, for people that understand the science, to go around saying as if they're close to this, that is a real shame. That's a real shame. But you know what's interesting about this is that when I get them alone in my office, they'll agree with me that we have no idea. We have no idea. But when they go out and they're starting to speak to the lay public, they speak with a far grander confidence than they will to me in my office. If I see a seminar on this, as soon as I walk in the room, 
the way they speak changes as soon as they see me. And so this tells you that under all of this, they really know that they're nowhere close. They're just nowhere close to this thing. So I think most of the lay public does this because they think that scientists know, but scientists don't really know. So a lot of this falls on the side of the scientists for projecting as if they know. And then they will say, well, you know, I never really said that. You know, the press kind of projected this. But then you don't see them calling the press back on this. You don't see that. And then you see the way they speak to the lay audience. So most of the world is just clueless. But there are a few who know, and they shouldn't be saying what they're saying. So if one of our audience members sees a headline, or maybe a National Geographic or Popular Science article or something announcing that scientists have created life in the laboratory, or they have you know, brought together a living cell under artificial circumstances, what are the questions they should ask in order to delve deeper into that and figure out if it's true? Okay, I mean, you can ask them, okay, so where did you get the proteins? And I'm gonna tell you. Oh, no, no, that was already there. We took the pro. okay. And so tell me, where'd you get the nucleic acids? Oh, those were already there. Where'd you get the lipid bilayer? Where did you get the lipids? Oh, that was already there. Where'd you get the sugars? Oh, they were already there. Okay, so let me ask you this then. Okay, so all the components you already took from a living system. Now, let me ask you, how did you do the assembly of the cell? How did you get this membrane around it and all these other... Oh, no, no, no. No, those were already there. The whole thing was already assembled. Oh, okay, so the thing was already assembled. So the one experiment that comes to mind is an experiment where they took the genome, they copied the genome, and they implanted it into a living cell. So they put other DNA into a living cell. The cell was already alive. They put in some DNA and they took out some DNA that was already there. But this happens all the time. A virus does this. I mean, talking a lot about viruses these days. So what viruses do is they come up to a cell and they inject in a cell viral DNA. And that DNA then becomes a part of that new host cell. And it becomes incorporated in there. So that virus didn't create that cell. It just injected new DNA. So this is something that happens in nature all the time. Every time you get some virus, every time you get the flu, you have now new DNA inserted into the genome, into your genome. And then this can actually get passed on because the genome has now been modified. That's what people do. And then on the other side, when they say they've made something that's almost like life, you say, tell me, what does it do that life does? Does it replicate? How does it replicate? And it replicates itself, does it? Tell me about that. And does it have respiration? Tell me about that. And so, you know, it's very easy to just take chemical systems and to get it to move. You can pour a little bit of oil on water. Go ahead, pour a little bit of olive oil on water and add a drop of dish soap to it. That oil will start whipping around and moving. You go, wow, that's alive. It's not alive. There's reactions that are occurring on the surface of that oil as it begins to dissolve because that soap is pulling off the molecules and causing it to dissolve. And so it starts moving in water. There are known, that's not alive. And so that wouldn't fulfill any definition of life, any biological definition of life. There's no respiration there. There's no replication there. And so it's fallacious. So we can't do this through any known natural processes. We can't even do this ourselves. It seems like our best attempts to create life under intelligent controlled circumstances in the laboratory amounts to basically installing a new operating system on an existing computer, right? So what is the alternative, Dr. Tour? Like, where does life come from? What is the best explanation? Because cells are here. We are here, despite how improbable their formation is. Yeah, I have no idea. As a scientist, I cannot say where cells came from. I can't say where the first cell came from. And it's really hard, if there were a first cell, to think that that first cell could do all that it had to do to generate all of us before decomposing and it falling apart would be really hard. But even, I have no idea where the first cell came from. And no scientist can tell you where it came from. So, you know, I don't. I don't use a God of the gaps argument that what I can't explain must be given to God. 
Not that I don't believe that God formed the heavens and the earth and everything that in them. I certainly believe that. But when I'm speaking as a scientist, all I can say is that as a scientist and as scientists, we have no idea where that first cell came from. Not only do we have no idea, we have no proposal on the table on how it might have formed. There's no, not even a proposal. We are absolutely clueless on every aspect of this. What do you think of Dr. Stephen Meyer's idea of inference to the best explanation and, and intelligence being the best explanation for the first cell? I don't have a way to gauge that scientifically. So within the realm of chemistry, we don't have a device that measures intelligence. And so, you know, I don't know how to gauge that. I'm certainly sympathetic with the argument. It would certainly appear as if that there needs to be, you know, a, a lot of forethought in this thing. But I don't know how to gauge that. So I don't, you know, it's not a tool that we use. I've never published a paper. Of all the papers I've written, I've never published a paper and talked about an intelligent designer. It's not even the types of terms that we use within my field. Hmm. Do you find that you're attacked and criticized as if you have made that suggestion just because you've criticized the standard sort of just so story for how life came together? Yeah, people do that all the time. I mean, the first statement on my website when it goes to that page is that I'm not a proponent of t intelligent design merely because I don't have a model, I don't have a tool to test that. And then the first thing they say, oh, so you're for intelligent design. So obviously they've never read anything that I've written and they're misquoting me and it's a way to try to dismiss me. Mm. But they have to see that, you know, I'm not pushing that. So even if I were pushing intelligent design, it does not negate all the arguments that I've put forth, but I don't even use that as an argument. I just say that we're utterly clueless. And um, yeah, I'm attacked all the time, but you know, you get kind of used to it after a while. And usually I can deflect that just by asking a couple of questions. So people stop attacking me to my face. They'll attack me behind my back, but as soon as I'm there in the room, everything begins to change. And you see them, they readily start backpedaling. You said earlier, speaking as a scientist, you don't have a mechanism to understand the origin of life or necessarily attribute it to intelligence. You personally, you know, you said you believe that God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Are you fairly comfortable with there being a large realm of mystery there as to how exactly that happened? Is that something that you think is a, a workable posture? No, actually, so scientists, it was actually believers in Jesus that really were the pushers of science because we believe that God set up this naturalistic world and there are naturalistic explanations that he has given us. We don't just, you know, why is there lightning in the sky? Well, because God did it. No, or we, Thor. Yeah, or Thor. We're trying to find an explanation for these things. There's a naturalistic explanation for things. So if we then someday come up with the understanding on how life was formed, it doesn't take away from God one bit. It, God is all the more magnanimous. This is how he did it. And you go, wow, so this is how you did it, Lord. This is how you set it up. And you spoke the word and then, boom, this is the naturalistic event that then followed when you spoke it forth. So everything we see, we've got a naturalistic world. So this is the beauty of being a scientist and being a believer, is that there is a naturalistic explanation for this, that God has done this. So I'm very comfortable with that. I don't just want to toss this thing out. I'm okay with people working on origin of life. I think they should just stop wasting their time on things that we know couldn't have been the way. This is just such a rich and inexhaustible topic. I mean, there's so much more that we can cover in a brief interview like this. What are some books and resources that our listeners can check out to learn more about the topic? Oh, you know, there's no good books on the origin of life. I've written on the problems of the origin of life. Books on the origin of life talk about little bags coming together and the most fit <laughs> bags working together. And so I don't want to steer people to that. So I've written on this topic. I've written for a journal called Inference. I've written four articles on origin of life. And it's a free online journal, so they can just go there. I'm not pushing a personal book. I mean, you just type in Inference, 
the mm -hmm. journal, and you'll see it, and then type in my name, or if you just did James Tour inference, it'll pop up, and you could read these articles, and I show all the problems that there are facing the origin of life community, and most recently an article that I wrote where I start specifically listing what people in the field have said and showing how that just couldn't have happened. Folks, we'll link to all of those articles Dr. Tour mentioned at breakpoint.org. Just click on the podcast, check out the resources below the program, and we'll tell you how to check those out. Dr. Tour, I want to thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. It's been just an incredibly eye-opening discussion. Well, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for listening to the Breakpoint Podcast. Please remember to come to WilberforceWeekend.org to register for our annual Wilberforce Weekend in May. It'll be an amazing weekend with great speakers. That's WilberforceWeekend.org. For the Colson Center, I'm Steve Ryder. Do good, be awesome.